Hello and welcome to Hoyland Spring, an exclusive web chat with Britain's most successful ever Olympian, Sir Chris Hoy. We're here in Perthshire at the home of Highland Spring, Chris's long-time sponsor, as they prepare to launch a limited edition Highland Spring bottle to honour his incredible sporting achievements. Now, there's still time to ask Chris your questions via Highland Spring's Twitter at Highland underscore Spring using the hashtag Highland Spring web chat or Facebook page Highland Spring Water. So without much further ado, let's get straight into the questions. Very welcome along. Chris, it's been a frantic few months. How has it been in, since the, all the excitement of the summer? It's been incredible just meeting the people, you know, going to various places and seeing how much of an impact that the team's performance has had. And, you know, it still hasn't really slowed down. I've, I've had very little time to get home or do anything. It's just been one event the next, but it's, it's been fantastic. And if you, were saying, you mentioned some of the fun things that you've been doing since the, the Olympics finished, mm -hmm. and one of them was being up in a, a fighter jet. Yes. That might have been a career for you. Well, I think that was a dream career. I think it still is <laughs> now. I don't know how old you have to be or how, how old's too old, but that was amazing. I went up to, to RAF Lookers and got taken out up in a typhoon, a Eurofighter, and it was just incredible. Got to actually fly the plane myself, you know, just for a little bit. And it sounds, maybe this comes out wrong, but it was actually really easy in terms of the plane is so advanced that it's just like a computer game. You've got your the stick for back, forward, you know, left, right, and then you've got the throttle, and it it's just it responds so quickly. It was incredible. Um, obviously, there's a lot of switches and stuff. I didn't know what they're doing, but these two basic controls, <laughs> you got to actually fly along. And um, the, but the guy, the, the pilot who was taking me out, he was doing all the kind of loops and the barrel rolls and all the, the acrobatics, and you know his skill coupled with this amazing plane, it was it was like nothing else I've ever experienced. I know you're very keen on um, fast cars as well, mm. and you had the opportunity, I think, to, to race one or two. Um, how much do you enjoy that? Is it just that thrill of speed, whether it's on the bike or in cars or in fighter jets? Yeah, it's well, I've got a little track car that I take to, to track days. I've not actually raced yet, but I do track days where you're essentially, you know, given a free rein and you can go as fast as you like. And it's just amazing what cars can do. You know, obviously you can't test cars on the road because, you know, you, you, for, for safety reasons and for speed limit reasons, but on the track, you can actually get to see what a car can do. And it is, it's the adrenaline, it's the sense of speed. I think it, it reminds me of what it's like when I first used to do BMX and that slight element of fear as well, which, you know, I think it's quite healthy to be slightly fearful of it. Um, but you come away just absolutely thrilled by it all and you, just the adrenaline you get and the, the rush um, and the noise and everything that goes with it. And it's, I think there's clear parallels between the, the driving and the, the cycling in terms of you know, looking ahead, picking your line, all the different things that you try and do in the bike, it's very similar in the cars. And not that I'm any good at driving a car, but it's, it's great fun. Um, and, you know, I've been passenger ride in, in rally cars before, and I've been to watch the Formula One, and, you know, all these different things that I'm very interested in. So, yeah, I do have a, a big passion for, for motorsport. And a question that's come in time and time again from too many people, too numerous to mention them all, but they all want to know your favourite Olympic memory, not just from London, but oh, going right. back through... My own personal memory or in, I of think other both, people? I think, um, I think my own personal memory would be one of two things. The first gold medal in Athens, stepping up in the podium there, or not even the podium, but crossing the line at the end of the, the four laps. And I was, as you mentioned earlier, when I was last to go, it was a time trial event. So one athlete at a time, last on the track as defending world champion. Everybody else had finished. They all set their times and it was just down to me that the world record had been broken three times before I stepped up there. And it was just this feeling of, right, this is it, now or never. For all I knew at that time, this was my one chance to become Olympic champion. And it was, it was like a dream. It was like everything that I imagined and I'd visualised and I'd hoped to, to, to pan out well, it was exactly as I hoped. And I crossed the line and just, I remember just looking up and seeing the scoreboard and seeing my name and won and then OR for Olympic record and just thinking, wow, this is it. Um, that was that was incredible, and you realise then that you're Olympic champion, first time ever. And I think the other the other time to compare with that would be the last gold medal in London. You know, winning a sixth gold in front of a home crowd, the last ever Olympics, seeing your your family, seeing your teammates down in front of you when you're on the podium. You know, all these things. It was just it sort of culminating at the the end of this Olympic journey, and um, that was a very special moment. And I think as a as a fan or as you know, looking at other moments throughout the Olympics that I've been to. You know, up until London, I think I would have said it was easy because, you know, there was only a few that I could really pick from that were very special. But during the London Games, there's so many performances by the British teams and the British athletes that blew me away. But before then, I would have said it would have to be um, Sir Steve Redgrave's fifth gold medal um, in Sydney. And, and 
it was, you know, to, to see that and to be part of that team, you know, to be there in Sydney and to, to be witnessing history, that was, that was very special. But I think now there's, there are so many in these games, you know, special moments that, that you know, to be part of this whole team this time around and to be, to be there to see it, it was very, very special indeed. Oh, fantastic. Um, a few more of our live social media questions uh, coming in. Um, Jackie Griffiths, do you worry about what you'll do post-retirement? Any plans you can share? Now, you, you hinted at this before, but yeah. uh, has, you know, at what point <coughs> do you start thinking about life after cycling? Well, I think cycling will always be there, but in terms of life after competitive cycling, you just, I think you know instinctively when it's time to do it. Hopefully you, you're able to make the choice and it's not made for you by you know, not being selected or being dropped from the team. But it's either going to happen in the next two years up to the Commonwealth Games or it will happen after the Commonwealth Games. So at least I know there's a definite end you know, which will be sometime between now and 2014. And I think the point is you have to find something that you're passionate about that you enjoy and you're driven to do, you know, that's not just for the sake of it and you, you feel like, you know, ideally, it, you don't want it to feel like a job, but you have to do it. You want to do it something that you, it's like a vocation that you really enjoy. Because my life so far has been spent doing something that I'm driven to do, that I'm passionate about. And hopefully um, this new project will be something that I can actually um, enjoy doing as much. Um, and I'm sure it will. But yeah, as I say, we'll, you know, five or six weeks' time, hopefully I'll be able to talk about it a bit more. Um, but it's something I've been working on for a while now, and yeah, it should be quite exciting. Um, uh, Dave Ellis asks, do you have any pre-race or pre-training rituals? Um, I don't have any superstitious things that I do, um, but I suppose a ritual would just be the routine that you do before you warm up and before you, you compete, and it's the same every time. It's the same warm-up procedure so that your body's ready to compete. And if you try and do different routines on race day, then it's, it's not a good idea because you could, you know, it might have an ad adverse effect. So I have the same warm-up routine, um, which I won't go into because it's a bit boring, but basically essentially just warming yourself up gradually, getting your body temperature up, and then doing some short, sharp efforts that get you ready for a, you know, an intense sprint. Okay. Well, that answers Dave's oh, question. Oh, sorry, and I also listen to music a lot as well. Put the headphones that, on. Well, actually then, I should ask you this. Big Dave says, what music do you listen to when you're cycling? Because I've seen you certainly in the velodrome often when you're on the rollers, mm. pre-competition, sitting with the big headphones on, yeah. and I'm sure you use them quite a lot in training as well. <coughs> yeah, we use them essentially to block out the distractions. So you could be at an Olympic Games or a World Championship, and there's TV cameras, and there's thousands of people, and there's noise, and there's races happening. And if you get caught up in that whole thing, and you can easily be distracted, and it can take your focus off your, your event. So I just put, head a lot of guys put the headphones on, get some music that helps them get their frame of mind ready for competition, uh, distractions, you know, put the distractions to the side, focus on your event. And I tend to normally, to get yourself really kind of hyped up and ready to go, it's usually quite loud, fast music. Uh, the Chemical Brothers are, you know, got a little playlist that I have with numerous different people, but the Chemical Brothers probably feature highly on that. Foo Fighters, um, a bit of Jay-Z, a bit of, it's a, quite a ver varied uh, playlist, but I also have some tracks which are a bit kind of calmer and, bit slower and a bit more atmospheric, which when you're really hyped up, you know, at certain events like the, the Athens Olympic Games before I raced the, the one kilometre time trial, I was just already so hyped up by the atmosphere that I, if I'd listened to some really fast loud music, it might have got me overly anxious. So I would kind of put on uh, Massive Attack, Angel, which is a really kind of dark sort of atmospheric track and just that really kind of calmed me down and got me in the right frame of mind to compete. Because on that day, your first gold medal, you'd seen the world record fall a number of times before it was your mm. chance to ride. And as the reigning world champion, you rode last. Um, wh who, you know, you say you, you put on a piece of music to suit the mood. It, that's quite a big call uh, to make that choice yourself at that time when, when there's so much going on, to have that wherewithal to mm. decide, OK, I'm going to just set the mood here. How do you... Where does that come I from? I think it's just instinctive. I think you know yourself, you know what you need. Um, and there's times, you know, often like in the gym when we're doing training, you know, middle of winter, you know, it could be six months from a competition um, and you just, you know, you get up in the morning, you're sore, your legs are killing you, you know, you're aching and you need something to sort of G yourself up. So we come at the gym and you'll crank the music right up and try and get an atmosphere going and try and get the boys to, you know, just to help each other and, and, and feed off the energy from each other. So there's times you really do need that kind of Ging up, but there's times when you just want to, you know, try and stay calm and stay focused and get ready for competition. And you just, you just do it instinctively. Bit of bagpipes, however. <laughs> bagpipes, I'll tell you what, there was a, it was the Commonwealth Games 2002 in Manchester and it was the team sprint bronze medal ride off. We were against uh, New Zealand and you get the bikes in the gate, the teams get lined up and you've got 50 seconds until 
till the start of the race. And we were just getting lined up, maybe you know, less than a minute to go. And somebody, it was actually a, a friend, um, or a guy I used to race BMX with years ago was there, a um, guy from Loch Arbor, and he, he's a piper, and he was in the stands with his bagpipes, and you could just hear this, you're playing Scott and the Brave in the background, and it was, you know, the hairs in your arms were standing up, and it was an incredibly powerful feeling. It was great, I'm sure it would be great for the other team as well, getting psyched out by this, uh, you know, the, the Scotland team were there, and they got the, back, they got the piper to psych themselves up, and it was, yeah, we did win the race, thankfully. Yeah. Good luck getting them in through security these <laughs> yeah, days. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, right, we have a question here from Valerie McKeating from Calendar, mm -hmm. just up the, not too far from here, Calendar. She mm -hmm. wants to know, how many saddles do you get through in a year? Um, wow, that's an interesting question. That's, <laughs> of all the questions, I was saying earlier on, I wonder if I'll get any questions I've not had before, but that's one I've not been asked before. Um, well, it just depends, Valerie. really. I think sometimes they break suddenly, so you can be going through the middle of the turn on the bike, in, on the track, and there's a lot of G-forces. When you're sitting right at the end of the saddle, it's pushing down on the nose of the saddle, and eventually, sometimes, that the rail that the saddle is on, it breaks. And it happened to a Spanish guy at the Olympics mm -hmm. this year in the, the time trial of the sprint on the track. He was a big... About six foot four, this guy must have weighed over 100 kilograms, and all the G force is pushing down with his weight. It was just too much for the saddle, and it snapped, and the whole thing came off. And he, I don't know how he stayed upright, but it looked painful. Um, but yeah, it doesn't happen very often. But I would say to prevent that sort of thing happening, you change your saddle fairly regularly. I would say you probably change it maybe four or five times a year. Great. What about bikes? How many bikes do you have? Well, the bikes. It, you never really have the same bike because it's always changing. So you might have components on the bike that will just be changed without you even knowing. The mechanics would, you know, for example, the chain gets changed regularly because there's so much strain going through the chains. That you, similarly with the saddle, you don't want your chain to break. If you're doing a standing start and you're putting all your weight through it, if it suddenly goes, you, can, you slip and you can hit your knee in the handlebars, you can injure yourself. So they tend to try and preempt any breakage by putting new stuff on regularly. So the bikes, the frames should be the same frame for the whole year. You know, the frames are strong enough, they should last. but you know, chain rings, sprockets, chains, grips, all kinds of things, toe straps, they're all, they're all um, regularly replaced without even knowing. You just turn up the track and, hey presto, the, the bike's clean and it's got new bits on it. That must be lovely. And the tires, often the old tires we used to use um, a few years ago, famously they, they could only do about 40 or 50 laps and then you'd, you'd throw them away and they were about 80 pounds a go. So particularly for the sprint, they were exceptionally lightweight and they're very low rolling resistance, but the tread was so thin, the rubber tread, that you could, if you did a standing start, often it would just rip the tread straight off. So they couldn't, you know, if you're riding for 40 laps, they would be gone by the end of that time. Jeez, so like just Formula for the sprinters. One. Yeah, very much so. Um, Charlotte Cole wants to know, if cycling hadn't worked out for you, what career path do you think you would have taken? Oh, you know what, that's a question I get asked fairly regularly, but I still haven't come up with a satisfactory answer. Um, I, I don't know, I really don't know. I, all I would say is that I changed courses. I was at university in St Andrews and I was doing physics and maths and I wasn't really enjoying, I was loving being there, but the actual course I wasn't really enjoying. And I transferred to Edinburgh to do sports science and to be closer to the velodrome so I could do my cycling and university at the same time. So I suppose if I hadn't had the cycling to go to change, I would probably just have kept going with the physics and maths and hopefully got a degree in physics and maths and, and who knows what I'll be doing right now. Obviously enjoying being back in Scotland mm. uh, for a few days and you're now a freeman of Edinburgh <laughs> and we saw you enjoying the welcome home in Glasgow. Um, there's a question here from Sarah Newnham. She says, What's, what, where is your favourite place in Scotland? Oh, that's a good question. I think it's got to be your home, hasn't it? It's, you know, I think coming back to Edinburgh, that's, there's actually a spot in Edinburgh where I used to go when I was a kid. We used to go up to Craig Lockhart Hill and um, you know, look down across the, the city and go for walks up there. And then there's times you're a bit older, you go up there and just sit. And you know, it's just a really nice, peaceful place to sort of watch. You get perspective on things. When you're up high, you can look down across the city and you know, the lights come on at night and all these things happening, hundreds of thousands of people down there, all their own lives, you know, various things happening. But you can just get above it all and just think, you know, get a bit of perspective. And I used to try and go there before, before a major championship, before each Olympic Games or Commonwealth Games when I was home, I would always try and make time to go up there and just sort of, you know, get things in perspective and think, you know what, it's just riding bikes, it's not that important. And, you know, it always helped to just kind of, yeah, get, just sort of, you know, take a, a reminder of where you'd come from as well. And, you know, just when you used to go up there as a kid. And that's, that's a beautiful spot. Um, but yeah, anywhere in Edinburgh, and there's, we're so lucky to be Scottish and have so many places that, that are just, Amazing. And I saw the old man of Hoy up in Orkney for the first time uh -huh. on the fighter jet flight. Um, we did a low fly just off the sea, just round Orkney. I'd never been before. Obviously seen pictures of it. 
So that was quite nice, to, or very nice, to see the uh, you know the old man of Hoyle, which for those people that aren't aware, it's a uh, you know an outcrop of rock on the coastline of uh, Orkney. You'll have to take a special trip up there and see it, not from the air, but maybe from a boat. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and have you been back to the Craig Lockhart Hill since the Olympics? I haven't yet. No, I mean I've I've literally been home for for maybe two, two or three days, but each time it's it's a flying visit and. Um, you know, if I can, well, it'll calm down soon, I'm sure, and there'll be more time to do stuff like that, and okay. that'll be very nice. <laughs> You'll not get any peace and quiet now. You've told everybody <laughs> that's where you go. Uh, and similar question, again, this has come from two, two or three people, I guess, in response to where your favourite place in Scotland is, but you've obviously travelled the world. You say that's one of the great attractions of your mm. sport. You've travelled to different uh, Olympic Games, Commonwealth Games, World Cups, different events. I think you're off to Rotterdam to the, mm. the sixth day in, in January, but a favourite place that you've travelled in the world, either through competition or just travelled? I think I'd have to say Perth in Australia. Um, we, we use Perth as our training base, or we have done in the past, for the last 12 or 13 years, and it's become almost like a second home. We do it in the winter when it's obviously their summer in Australia, and we usually stay you know, between five and eight weeks at a time. So you do get to know the place, you've got a chance to train and be, be settled. It's not like you're just staying for a few days in a hotel. You stay in apartments and you, you, know, you, you travel around, you meet people and, and you know, the, the family that run the, the apartments that we, um, we've gone to for the last 12, 13 years, you, know, you kind of get to know them. There's actually relatives that I found out once we've been going out there for, for a few years, my auntie, who sort of does family tree stuff and had traced back relatives, found out that we had relatives living in Perth. So I went out, found them, and or it started out by actually me, my auntie asked me to go to a graveyard, a cemetery, and try and find tombstones of the family, and uh, use that, that information. She, she traced the family in Perth, and then I met, met the family in Perth, and then ever since then I've actually you know, been seeing them every year. And it's, it's lovely to have family in such a far-flung part of the world. And of course, here in Scotland, we have some of the most amazing mountain biking uh, in the whole world, really. I mean, we've had some major, major events here. Absolutely. Uh, and in addition, there's the, the BMX track down in, in Manchester, the, the one in London. Um, it's not just track cycling. No. If, you, if you're keen to get involved in cycling, there's all sorts of other opportunities there. Exactly, because you could have, you know, you could enjoy the, the endurance test more of road cycling or mountain biking. You might enjoy the, the thrill of BMX racing or the track racing. Almost any kind of um, you know, cycling you can think of, there's, there's a great provision for it in the UK and hopefully near where you live. But yeah, as I say, the best place to go is through British Cycling website and they'll, they'll give you assistance and put you in the right direction. And there's also you know, numerous events, just fun events you can turn up to non-competitive around the country and, and join in and just ride with uh, similarly minded people. Yeah, there's thousands and thousands of clubs all over the country mm. that you can get involved with too. Um, some quick fire questions from some of your fans here. Bab Shields asks, what's the fastest speed you've achieved on a bike? The fastest speed I've achieved on the track um, is, without any pacing behind a motorbike or anyone else, is about 75 and a half mile, uh, 75 and a half kilometers an hour, which is about 45 miles an hour. Um, behind a motorbike in training, we use that for speed training, and you can go up to 85, almost 85 kilometers an hour. But you can go a lot quicker if you're going downhill out in the road. You know, you could hit over 100 kilometers an hour if you get a, a clear, straight, fast downhill run. But I wouldn't recommend that. Question here from Ewan Shelley. He says, we've heard who your sporting heroes are when you were growing up. Gavin Hastings, Graham O'Brien, you mentioned. Who are your current sporting heroes? Who do you look up to at the moment? I look up to Roger Federer um, as an international sporting icon and the way that he deals with you know, what must be an incredibly physically demanding you know, tour. He's on the go all the time. He's competing in all the different Grand Slams and still trying to maintain his, his world ranking. And he deals with, you know, he's still obviously right up there, but he deals with winning and losing um, the same way. He's very gracious in defeat. Um, he's very, you know, nice towards his, his opponents when he beats them. Um, and I think, you know, his longevity as well, the fact he's managed to keep it going for so long, um, I just think the way he handles himself is, is something that most athletes aspire to be like. And, uh, you know, although tennis isn't a game that I've ever really played or tried it, you know, I can appreciate what they, they go through. And I've been to Wimbledon a number of times. I've actually watched Roger, Roger Federer, unfortunately, beat... Um, Andy at the, the Andy Murray at the um, Australian Open, which was a shame, but I was cheering for Andy that day, but even though I do admire Roger Federer a huge amount. And of course, Andy, coming off the back of that wonderful US Open mm. uh, win, were you able to watch that? Um, I saw a little bit of it. I was in London at the time, and it was, again, one of these days that was so busy with uh, events. I was trying to keep up with it and, you know, grabbing a quick look at the TV, and I've actually watched it since, the full, the full match, and uh, just amazing, you know, because... I know Andy and I know his mum and you know, I've 
I feel like I've been on the journey with him, even though I've hardly met him. You know, I've been travelling to watch him at Wimbledon. And again, I saw him in Australia, in Melbourne, at the, the final of the, US, the Australian Open. We were out in Perth training, and I managed to get a flight across. And, you know, it, it, for so long, you think, oh, he's, get, he's almost there, he's almost there. And he worked so hard. And, and you know, people were saying, oh, he's, he's not going to do it now. He's been to so many finals. And I still felt that he could do it. And I really think the Olympics were so important for his confidence and just that momentum. OK, it wasn't a Grand Slam, but it's the nearest thing you can get to it, an Olympic gold medal. And he did it, and he, he beat Roger Federer in straight sets, and finally, on the biggest stage, or the, nearly the biggest stage, he'd done it. And that hopefully gave him the springboard to, to win in the US Open. And I'm sure that win now will give him the confidence to win even more. Had you made it along to the US Open, you wouldn't have been able to get in the box because Alex Ferguson was there, <laughs> Sean Connery. It was packed out, wasn't Maybe it? I'm a bad luck, uh, you know, I'm a bad, bad luck charm. Yeah. And it's my fault. <laughs> He'll not be allowed if I hadn't gone before, time. he would have won before, yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Um, so what's in the immediate future for you now? We've hint you've hinted that you've got this plan yep. and sort of thing that's going to be announced maybe five or six weeks' time. Yep. You're, you're keeping under wraps for yep. the moment. But have you got a little bit of a break in the horizon? Um, I've got a holiday in November, and until then, it's still just really, really busy. I've got a race. There's the opening race meeting in Glasgow, uh, end of October, which I'll be attending, and that's my first race since the Games. It'll be a bit of fun, really, nothing too serious, because I've hardly trained, so I think I'll be uh, potentially getting uh, getting a kick in from the boys, but you know, it'll be good fun just to be able to race there. Um, then, yeah, off on holiday in November, and then hopefully out to Australia in, in December to start getting back in training again and doing some more sort of consistent training because it's it's very hard because when you're at home there's so many things you can do and you, you know it's just obviously the weather starts getting worse as well so we'll be out in Australia and then Rotterdam in January for a six-day race and just see how it goes from there. Oh no the six-day race in Rotterdam that'll be quite something. Oh it's great I mean for those that aren't aware what a six-day is it's it started in, in Madison Square Gardens and essentially it was a race that lasted for six days and six nights non-stop and it was a like a relay team of two riders and that's how the Madison started, the, the hand sling event that you see in the track. And it's changed now a bit, but essentially it's for six nights in a row there's, there's racing. Starts about eight o'clock in the evening, finishes about one or two in the morning. And they have lots of different events, Madison races, Kieran races, sprints, scratch races. And it's a huge spectacle. You can get 10,000 people turning up. The track centre is full of people. And the riders are just crammed into a little far corner. And it's like an open bar in the track centre. And there's, there's a table that you can get food at. And there's you know lasers and you know, noise and everything. It's, it's just really a massive big spectacle. And the cycling is, is almost like a sideshow to the whole thing. So it's about having fun. And the racing is flat out and it's fast and furious, but the, the emphasis is on fun and entertainment. Sounds great. It's great fun, yeah. Um, we've mentioned this, the Sir Chris Hoy Velodrome, uh, obviously in Glasgow. And um, so that's now got your name in it. What, what do you think of the new, uh, <laughs> I think these are Highlands. These ones are, we, yeah, the new ones. The new Highland, there we go. Yeah. There we are. What do you think well, of that? I'm amazed by it. It's, I think it's brilliant. I saw, I had a box sent to, to my house just before the Olympic Games and it had, it was a big box, big cardboard box with my face on it and it said Hoyland Spring and I thought it was just like a, the box that, that the guys at Hoyland Spring had badged up as a kind of good luck um, gift and it was only when I got back from the Games I actually opened the box because I kept the box, I didn't want to damage the box, I opened it and uh, inside <laughs> there was, it was filled with Hoyland Spring bottles and I was just, I was like, I gave them one to each of my members of family who were, you know, still called Hoy so they could have as a memento and yeah. you know it's like a nice bottle of whiskey you don't open it you know it's kept as a, a souvenir <laughs> and then i found out there's gonna be a million bottles uh, with my name on it <laughs> and uh, yes it's because at first you don't always notice it because it's sort of, the logo is so recognizable you don't necessarily read the letters but to see uh, to see your name in such a great way on that it's yeah really amazing very pleased yeah no listen it's great to, to have had you here it's you've been fantastic coming along and, and sharing your thoughts and thanks for all your questions so uh, great pleasure to interview chris today uh, and thanks for your time. Thanks to everybody who got in touch with your questions. Sorry we weren't able to get through them all. Uh, but don't forget, you can watch the web chat again on highlandspring.com or on YouTube by searching for Highland Spring. Thanks very much. Goodbye. Thank you.